In 2019, mechanical engineer William Osmond was trying to figure out how to make use of a common waste product, sawdust. A walk in the park left him thinking, people eat plants all the time, so why not eat trees? Osmond decided to use sawdust as a cheap alternative for a food ingredient. Considering the American food most resembling an actual piece of wood is the Rice Krispie Treat, Osmond decided to test just how much of the crisp rice he could replace with sawdust without consumers noticing. Incredibly, he found you could replace 15% of the rice with sawdust without too noticeable of a difference in the final treat. No idea. No way. That's I, indistinguishable. I have literally no idea there's sawdust in here. That's amazing. Osmond's switcheroo was very clever, but pales in comparison to the gigantic switcheroo pulled on our global food supply over the past hundred years that would lead to today's people switching out a very common type of food that we had eaten for thousands of years in favor of something edible but foreign to the human diet and as I'll argue here, maybe even toxic, vegetable oil. Mazzola corn oil. Crisco oil and Vegetable corn and sunflower oil. Low cost vegetable oil is in everything from packaged foods to restaurants and kitchens across the world. Vegetable oil. It's canola oil. Vegetable oil. Canola oil. As consumption of vegetable oils exploded, rates of obesity and diabetes happened to explode with it. To understand why some doctors and scientists are saying vegetable oils make us fat and diseased, we need to take a look at some history, why some animals live longer than others, some tapes hidden in a basement, how vegetable oils are actually made, and what happens in your body when you eat them. Let's start in 1829. Thanks to new machinery, it became practical to make use of the leftover garbage from cotton production, cotton seeds. The oil extracted from cotton seed could be used as fuel for lamps or lubricant for machinery. In the early 1880s, Thomas Hudnut invented a mechanical way to extract oil from corn germ. Up until then, corn germ was a byproduct that corn refiners threw away. In 1898, corn oil started to be used as commercial cooking oil. And in 1902, the Hudnut mills were selling 36 million gallons of corn oil per year. In 1911, the soap maker Procter & Gamble came out with a new product, crystallized cottonseed oil. Crisco looked a lot like the common cooking fat, lard. Before 1900 or so, everyone used virtually 100% animal fats to cook. But Procter & Gamble figured their newer, cheaper product Crisco looked a lot like lard. So why not get people to eat Crisco instead? They launched a massive marketing campaign presenting their cottonseed oil product as the newer and cleaner cooking fat that made cheap, better tasting foods. In 1911, Procter & Gamble spent about $5 million worth of today's money to advertise Crisco and it became popular immediately. Just the next year in 1912, sales of Crisco amounted to 2,600,000 pounds. That same year in 1912, James B. Herrick published a paper on what is thought to be the first heart attack accurately described in a medical journal. You see, heart disease was actually a very rare condition before the 1900s or so. Crisco continued to ramp up their advertising and in 1916, Crisco sales had reached 60 million pounds. When the heart stops beating, death is not in fact instantaneous. In 1924, heart disease was rising and the American Heart Association, the AHA, was founded but remained quite small and poorly funded for quite a while. In 1945, soybean oil reached 1.3 billion pounds produced, overtaking cottonseed oil as the leading edible oil in the United States. In 1948, the American Heart Association finally got its big break when Procter & Gamble, the makers of Crisco, designated the AHA to receive the $1.7 million from Procter & Gamble's radio contest. And as the American Heart Association's own history book reads, it says, and overnight millions poured into our coffers. Heart disease was still on the rise and in 1955, President Dwight Eisenhower had a heart attack and the public was painfully aware of just how big a deal heart disease was. Then, just six years later in 1961, the American Heart Association had the answer to heart disease. The AHA recommended everyone to replace saturated fats like those found in animal fat with the polyunsaturated fats 
like those found in vegetable oils to prevent heart attack and stroke. It's 94% unsaturated. No oil is lower. By the way, saturated fat consumption didn't really correlate with rates of heart disease before or after 1961 when the AHA made their recommendation. And remember, we ate close to zero grams of polyunsaturated fat-rich vegetable oils before 1900 when heart disease was rare. Okay, so we went from zero in 1865 to 80 grams a day. Now let me just say, this is an infinite increase in vegetable oil consumption. That makes this the single greatest change to nutrition in all of history. I don't think anything else can even begin to compare. A third of our diet is coming out of factories that make these oils. Just like all these odd corn oil ads wanted us to do, we added huge amounts of polyunsaturated fat to our diet. And today, edible oil is now a hundred billion dollar industry. So is this massive increase in polyunsaturated fat rich vegetable oil actually bad or just benign? You can find various anecdotes here and there of people clearing up ailments as bad as arthritis or irritable bowel syndrome and losing plenty of weight by removing vegetable oils from their diet. Molecular biologist Brad Marshall even came up with a croissant diet where he'd totally removed vegetable oils from his diet and lost plenty of stubborn weight while eating croissants. Even Dr. Kate Shanahan, nutritionist for the LA Lakers, removed vegetable oils from their diet plan. But these are just anecdotes, so let's move on. As mentioned, vegetable oil consumption happens to correlate with diabetes and obesity. But again, we can't get too excited. This is just a correlation. Next, it's well known that the size of an animal relates to how long it will live. The larger an animal, the longer it lives. But there are plenty of outliers. For example, humans can live over 100 years, but Based on the size of humans, we should expect a 70 kilogram human to live only 26 years. Also, the 35 gram naked mole rat lives about five times longer than we should expect from its size. Then researchers found another way to predict lifespan that accounts for some of these outliers like humans and the naked mole rat. They found that if the cells of the animals are made up more of the fats that are hard to oxidize or break down, they live longer. If the fats in their cells are easy to oxidize, they don't live as long. And these vegetable oils we're eating are mainly comprised of polyunsaturated fat, which is very easy to oxidize. Unfortunately for us, a 2015 review in the American Society for Nutrition found that the key polyunsaturated fat in vegetable oils, an omega-6 fat called linoleic acid, accumulates and sits in our bodies the more we eat it. The percentage of this linoleic acid in people's fat cells has nearly doubled from a bit under 10% in 1960 to around 20% in 2005. But remember, we were already eating plenty of vegetable oil by 1955. The next thing I'm going to show you, I searched for for three years. Do you know what I wanted to know? What was the omega-6 fat in anybody's adipose who was on an ancestral diet? As Dr. Chris Kenobi discovered, these Pacific Islanders who were eating a diet unadulterated by vegetable oils, the concentration of polyunsaturated linoleic acid in their bodies was only 3.8%, five times less than what people are getting today. 3.8% people, this is where we should be. And this is what keeps you healthy. So animals that have cells that oxidize easily don't live too long. And we've been eating tons of these easily oxidizing oils. But what data do we have on humans, vegetable oils, and lifespan? Says Dr. France, I've heard the possibility that there might be some very interesting data in your father's basement. This is cardiologist Robert France on an episode of Malcolm Gladwell's revisionist history titled The Basement Tapes concerning Robert France's father, Ivan France. Ivan France chose to devote his life to studying heart disease, specifically to understanding the role of cholesterol and blood lipids in heart attacks. Back in the 1960s, Ivan France conducted a meticulously controlled study that would shed light on what actually happens when people cut out saturated fats and eat polyunsaturated vegetable fats instead. The study, which would be called the Minnesota Coronary Survey, 
took years to set up and had more than 9,000 research subjects. Since people were living in institutions, they could control exactly what the people ate. It ran for five years, from 1968 to 1973. The patients in France's study would go for their meals in the cafeteria and get one of two trays. They'd look completely identical. But one tray was food cooked with vegetable oil. The other had everything cooked in saturated fat. This was a beautifully organized study. There was lots of money, nothing, no holes were barred to try to do a good job. To this day, it stands as one of the most rigorous diet trials ever conducted. So what does the Minnesota study show? The patients on the vegetable oil diet did end up with lower cholesterol than the people who ate food cooked with animal fats. But the vegetable oil people didn't live longer, which made no sense. They were eating the kind of diet everyone believed should help you live longer. For whatever reason, Ivan France sat on his data for 15 years until he finally published the results in 1989. And his study was all but forgotten for a quarter century. That is, until researcher at the NIH, Christopher Ramsden, tracked down Ivan France's son for the old tapes containing the raw data from this study. The people who were over 65, who had been on the the diet for more than a year, the more their cholesterol was lowered, the higher the risk of an adverse outcome. Here, by adverse outcome, he means death. People over 65 were dying faster if they ate a so-called healthy diet. There's no good evidence that reducing saturated fat makes you live longer. The best clinical trials we have reach the opposite conclusion. In Ramsden's paper on the Minnesota Coronary Survey, he essentially says that the reason we assumed vegetable oils are healthy up until now is because researchers weren't completely publishing the actual results of their studies. Let me remind you that vegetable oils are everywhere. In many packaged foods, chips, rice chips, crackers, salad dressings, sauces, biscuits, mixed nuts, granola bars, Most mayonnaises are basically a jar of soybean oil. I'm not in the US at the moment, but even most of these nicely packaged meals at this expensive Japanese supermarket contain these cheap vegetable oils. Most restaurants and chefs use vegetable oils because they have a neutral flavor and, well, they're cheap. People have asked me what I think about plant-based meats in the past, and one reason I'm not keen on them is because they're simulating the fattiness of real meat with a bunch of vegetable oils. Canola, soybean, grapeseed, sunflower, safflower, corn, and all kinds of polyunsaturated vegetable oils have replaced saturated fats in our food supply. Okay, so why? Why specifically would vegetable oils be bad for our health? Well, average Americans today are eating five to six tablespoons of vegetable oils per day. That's around 700 calories of oil filled with polyunsaturated fat. It's almost impossible to get this amount naturally. There's so little oil per ear of corn that it takes 98 ears or 12,000 calories of corn to get you five tablespoons of corn oil. 625 grapes or 2,800 sunflower seeds will get you five tablespoons of grapeseed or sunflower oil. So a long industrial process is dedicated to ripping oil out of these tiny seeds. As mentioned earlier, polyunsaturated vegetable fats oxidize very easily. Oxidize simply means to react with oxygen. This is how metals rust, and this is why meat that you leave out turns brown after a while. Oxidation changes the structure and properties of fats for the worse. McDonald's actually used to fry their fries in beef fat, which was a really good idea because it tasted better, and the saturated fat in the beef fat is very resistant to oxidation. It's been common knowledge for a very long time that it's the unsaturated fats that are fragile and polyunsaturated fats are far more fragile than monounsaturated fats. The main polyunsaturated fat in vegetable oil, linoleic acid, is 40 times more prone to oxidation than the monounsaturated oleic acid you find in olive oil. This is why your expensive bottle of olive oil is dark green and says to store it in a cool, dark place. Olive oil is mostly monounsaturated fat, but 10% of it is fragile polyunsaturated fat. Since light, exposure to oxygen, and especially heat all speed up oxidation, 
The olive oil will oxidize faster and worsen the flavor if you don't store it properly. That's because when fats oxidize, they produce oxidation products that give the fat a bad flavor. And these oxidation products are actually toxic. For example, the toxic aldehydes are one of the fat oxidation products. In fact, acetaldehyde is thought to be what makes you feel terrible during a hangover. Professor of Bioanalytical Chemistry in the UK, Martin Grootfeld, received some press for suggesting that vegetable oils are not a healthy cooking oil despite the National Health Service saying so. His research showed that meals fried in vegetable oil contain 100 to 200 times more aldehydes than the daily limit set by the WHO. So if you must fry your foods at high temperatures, the far more resilient saturated fats like coconut oil or butter produce far less of these harmful compounds. Ironically, the reason McDonald's switched to frying everything in vegetable oil was thanks to Phil Sokoloff, a Nebraskan millionaire who in 1985 began spending his personal fortune on his crusade to stop others from consuming so much saturated fats, which Sokoloff thought were responsible for his heart attack. His extensive anti-saturated fat marketing campaign was effective, and eventually, McDonald's backed down and swapped oxidation-resistant beef tallow for easily oxidizable vegetable oil in 1990. The intense processing necessary to simply get the oil out of tiny seeds and into bottles easily damages them. Heat is a great way to oxidize fats, and vegetable oil is repeatedly heated long before it ever arrives in a kitchen. There are many steps to create edible oil, and several of them involve very high heat. The oil is heated to 80 degrees Celsius during the acid wash process. In the neutralization process, the oil can get up to 95 degrees Celsius. The bleaching earth step is carried out between 90 and 110 degrees centigrade for 30 minutes. At this point, the oil has oxidized so much that it's rancid and would taste terrible and smell awful if you ate it as is. This is why there is a final intensive deodorization process. During this extensive deodorization process, the oil is heated once again and can reach as high as 260 degrees Celsius or 500 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 125 degrees hotter than the temperature needed for deep frying. There's something called the Israeli paradox. Israel has one of the highest omega-6 polyunsaturated fat consumptions in the world. Their omega-6 consumption is 8% higher than the USA and 10 to 12% higher than most of Europe. To quote this paper, despite such national habits, there's a paradoxically high prevalence of cardiovascular diseases, hypertension, type two diabetes, and obesity. Now, the other thing about the fragile polyunsaturated omega-6 linoleic acid in vegetable oils is it's still problematic even if not heated. Heat isn't the only way to oxidize vegetable oils. They can oxidize just sitting on the shelf. Walnut oil, for example, which has plenty of linoleic acid, will readily oxidize in just a matter of days while simply sitting in storage, as you can see here. Vegetable oils also oxidize while sitting in your body, creating toxic oxidation products like an aldehyde called 4-HNE. 4-HNE is actually considered to be the most toxic aldehyde, and this compound has been associated with aging, heart disease, diabetes, and Alzheimer's. Neuroscientist Tetsumori Yamashima has done plenty of research on vegetable oils and 4-HNE. He's published multiple papers on the damaging effects of this compound and why people need to avoid vegetable oils because they oxidize into 4-HNE in our bodies. This book of his is titled Stop Eating Vegetable Oils to Save Your Brain and Blood Vessels. He's even gone as far as to say that the real culprit behind Alzheimer's disease is vegetable oil. Now, that's just the research of one neuroscientist, but other research like this done at the Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple University found canola oil in the diet to be associated with worsened memory, worsened learning ability, and weight gain in mice. Also, Alzheimer's prevalence happens to correlate with vegetable oil consumption, but again, this is just a correlation. Do you ever feel more tired than you should be, like you're just low on energy and can't concentrate for seemingly no reason and you're thinking, is it normal to require this much coffee just to muster the energy to function? But what is energy when you're talking about the body? 
Here's a pop quiz. What do breathing, food, cyanide, and Star Wars all have in common? Midichlorians, the microscopic life forms living in the cells of living things that determine your propensity to use the force. Actually, no, but midichlorians are obviously based off of mitochondria. Mitochondria are found in nearly all cells in the human body. They are the powerhouse of the cell and the reason you breathe and eat food. Mitochondria use food calories and oxygen to create energy in the form of a compound called ATP. We are incredibly reliant on our mitochondria to smoothly and efficiently produce massive amounts of energy. We need so much energy that if you took all the molecules of ATP you made in a day and put it on the scale, it would weigh as much as you. We make our body weight in ATP every day. If you messed up this energy supply, things would go haywire rapidly. This is how cyanide kills people so quickly it damages the mitochondria's ability to make energy. Unsurprisingly, some instances of feelings of excessively low energy or fatigue have been linked to poor mitochondria function. Evolutionary biologist Dr. Douglas C. Wallace is arguing here that medicine focuses too much on anatomy and not enough on animation. That is, the energy production necessary to animate the anatomy. Scientists are starting to see that mitochondrial dysfunction may play a central role in the development of many diseases, including heart disease and Alzheimer's. That's not all that surprising because the heart and brain require massive amounts of energy to work properly. It's also well known that the mitochondria are dysfunctional in obesity and diabetes. In fact, the world's most prescribed diabetes drug, metformin, which is one of the few that also helps patients lose weight, acts on the mitochondria. Okay, but where does vegetable oil come into play in all of this? Well, surprise, surprise, vegetable oils can damage the mitochondria. To make this real simple, you can think of the mitochondria's energy production as a conveyor belt at a factory that's pumping out ATP energy. After your body pulls electrons from the food you eat, complexes and electron transporters pass electrons down this conveyor belt, the inner membrane of the mitochondria. This results in protons being pumped up here and then the protons get sucked into this ATP synthesis enzyme to make ATP. Now the conveyor belt, the inner membrane, has plenty of something called cardiolipin. This is important because this is what's damaged when you consume plenty of vegetable oils. When the linoleic acid from vegetable oils accumulates in your body, you can get what's called a peroxidation cascade, where kind of like dominoes, one molecule of linoleic acid oxidizes and produces a substance that can oxidize another molecule of linoleic acid, and that produces more of that substance that can go on and damage another molecule of linoleic acid, and so on and so on. It's a chain reaction. This chain reaction can go on to affect the cardiolipin in your mitochondria. As this study shows here, when rats eat a linoleic acid-rich vegetable oil diet, markers of oxidized fat doubled. And in the heart, the content of cardiolipin, the stuff your mitochondria needs to properly produce energy, was reduced fivefold. In this study, the cardiolipin of diabetic and non-diabetic rats reduced drastically when they were fed a vegetable oil diet. And the mitochondria of the vegetable oil fed diabetic rats completely collapsed into these crumpled blobs. Even the textbook Recent Advances in Mitochondrial Medicine acknowledges that omega-6 fatty acids like those found in vegetable oil may damage various organs including the pancreas which would worsen metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes. So going back to the first study, what happened to the normal rats whose mitochondrial cardiolipin was reduced so much from eating vegetable oils? In just four weeks, these rats had heart failure. Developing heart failure that fast is very alarming, but of course humans are not rats, so it's not like eating a bunch of mayonnaise will give you heart failure in a couple weeks. It's going to take a very long time of consuming plenty of vegetable oil for damage to become apparent. But how long? Well, let me mention one last study. The 1969 LA Veterans Administration Hospital Study, another very well-controlled clinical diet trial where people over 60 were given either animal fats or vegetable oils. To cut to the chase, the people in the vegetable oil group were dying more. And this was the case even though there were twice as many heavy smokers in the animal fat group. 
The interesting part is that this study was so long, eight years, and it took many years to clearly see the negative effect of the vegetable oil diet. The study authors concluded that to truly understand the negative health effect of vegetable oils, maybe studies need to be much longer than eight years, but most only last five years at best. So to sum all this up, vegetable oils which are rich in the polyunsaturated omega-6 fat linoleic acid displace saturated fats which we had been eating for thousands of years. The consumption of these new oils happen to correlate with rates of obesity, diabetes, and Alzheimer's. Correlations are just correlations, but it's well known that polyunsaturated fats oxidize very easily, creating oxidation products which are toxic to humans. Not only that, but linoleic acid accumulates in the body where it can oxidize, creating these harmful oxidation products and damaging our mitochondria. And lastly, well-controlled clinical trials have found worse outcomes for people on a vegetable oil diet. So something I've been thinking about is, if this is such a big deal, why isn't it a bigger topic? Why aren't more people interested in vegetable oils the way people are interested in the health effects of, say, sugar? Well, I think the difference is sugar tastes and makes us feel great. If you took it out of your food, you'd definitely notice. So I think some people intuitively think, this has got to be too good to be true. Maybe sugar is bad for me. But with vegetable oils, they're a lot like the sawdust in William Osmond's Rice Krispie Treats. They're just there, hard to notice, hiding in your food. I mean, how often do you think about the fat used to make your food? If someone swapped the sugar in your coffee with stevia or Splenda, you'd notice pretty quickly. But could you even tell if the aromatic vegetables you ordered at a restaurant were sautéed in canola oil instead of butter? Here's a quick quiz where the answer might surprise you. The greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere absorb radiation strongly in the infrared wavelengths. When they absorb light, they heat up, and eventually this heat is spread mostly through convection around the Earth's surface. Warm objects like Earth and the Sun both emit heat in the form of infrared radiation. So, is the greenhouse effect predominantly driven by infrared radiation emitted from the Earth or the Sun? If you want to know the answer, you'll have to check out Brilliant's Physics of the Everyday course. If you're naturally curious or want to build your problem solving or analytical abilities, you'll enjoy Brilliant's thought-provoking math, science, and computer science content designed to break complex scientific concepts down into understandable chunks. Like this lesson on neural networks. It takes you from how a computer learns to play tic-tac-toe up to how artificial neurons are trained. With over 60 interactive courses in math, science, and computer science, Brilliant will grow your understanding of our modern world with a structured and engaging approach. Check out brilliant.org slash WIL, and the first 200 people to follow my link will get 20% off the annual subscription.